meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to first announce that the Green Mountain Care Board submitted two reports yesterday. One was the hospital sustainability report, and the other was the reimbursement variation report. Both of these reports are on our website under what's new. Also, they're under legislative reports. And if you have a hard time finding them, please reach out to me or Kara and we can make sure you find them. Um, I just want to make sure that I thank stakeholders uh, for both of these reports. We, we know it was a hard time over the last couple of years to take time to provide input um, on both of these reports. So I just want to thank you for providing your valuable input to our staff as we finished up these reports and submitted them to the legislature. We're really looking forward to the next steps on both of these reports. I also want to announce that we have um, a couple of public comment uh, sessions going on right now. The first is in regard to the essential health benefits benefit benchmark plan. We heard about that last week. And if we could have those comments to the board by close of business February 11th, then they could be considered for the potential vote that is that are scheduled on February 16th or March 2nd of 2022. And then I will also announce that we are uh, have been accepting public comments for about the last year over a year on a potential next agreement with our federal partners for an all payer model. Please send those to us if you have any comments regarding those next steps. We are sharing all those comments with the governor's office as well as our AHS partners as they are leading the negotiations. And then last but certainly not least, please take a look at our website for the calendar for February. Our meetings are listed. Um, we have a couple of extra meetings beyond the board meetings. Uh, we had one yesterday, the Data Governance Council meeting. We also have our primary care advisory group on February 16th, which starts at 5 p.m. If you have any questions, please reach out. I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, January 26th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 26th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion passed unanimously. So next we're going to um, turn to a discussion of the healthcare strategic workforce plan, and we're going to receive an update from the director of healthcare reform, Ina Backus. So, Ina, whenever you are ready, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Chair Mullen. I would like to give an update. There's been a lot of progress um, towards implementing the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan on numerous levels, um, both strat and and a number of strategies um, articulated in that plan uh, featured in the administration's proposals to the legislature. Uh, we've, uh, since submitting the plan, uh, we've, we've recommended um, support for a program of recruitment, retention, and training, which we are pleased to be working uh, with the legislature uh, on. We've also recommended um, increasing uh, the dollars available for scholarships for nurses, increasing the dollars available for nurse loan repayment, and have proposed a refundable income tax credit for nurses and nurse educators. And further, we propose specific strategies as, as um, as recommended by the workforce development plan to promote Vermont as a excellent place to live and work as a nurse specifically. Um, and uh, further, um, there is work underway regarding um, 
marketing campaign which would promote enrollment in career and technical education programs and emphasize those careers for healthcare providers, um, as well as um, initiatives that have been provided for in the budget proposal to support uh, expanding the availability of housing in Vermont, as well as um, as well as bolstering child care availability in the state. That's a you know, very high level, broad overview of a lot of different pieces uh, that have been proposed to be uh, supporting nurse and healthcare workforce in the state of Vermont. We are also actively working across departments and agencies in state government uh, to address other recommendations in the report, um, such as uh, convening with um, the programs of health education to explore uh, the barriers to increasing enrollment um, in uh, education programs for nurses specifically. And we're certainly working uh, across entities um, to think strategically about um, how we, again, uh, attract, retain, and really uh, advance Vermont as an ideal place for uh, working in the healthcare field. Do you want to take questions at this point? I can certainly take questions. I can provide some more. If you're interested in, in going into detail on some of the aspects of the proposals, I'm happy to do that as well. But some I detail to would be great. Give an overview of the of the breadth of work that's been taking shape um, since we last talked about the healthcare workforce development plan. Um, specific to the recruitment, retention, and training proposal, uh, we're proposing to invest dollars to be available for uh, recruitment, retention, and training of healthcare providers. That proposal is for dollars uh, through the Budget Adjustment Act, and we're proposing that AHS um, uh, administer a needs-based program to support providers with recruitment, retention, and training needs. The program would allow flexibilities for employers uh, to propose how to allocate funding within the terms and conditions of the program um, and, and to identify uh, recruitment needs, retention needs, training needs, and other creative incentives that could provide for um, more interest in working for Vermont-based uh, employers. This program proposal does uh, include a service agreement component where the employer uh, in receipt of the funds would, would provide those funds to employees contingent on a service agreement. We've proposed a service agreement um, that could be 12 to 24 months. I think we have to continue to um, to hone in on what that agreement would be as we look to implement if we're successful in uh, implementing the program. Um, that program would look at needs based on vacancy, potentially look at, have a needs assessment based on vacancy rates, um, based on turnover for organizations, um, certainly based on organize, you know, main Maintaining critical capacity um, to maintain access to care. Additional dollars, as I say, were as I said, were proposed also to support nurse scholarships and would continue ex and expand upon the existing scholarship program uh, for Vermonters and out-of-state individuals to attend nursing programs at uh, Vermont colleges and universities. Um, as uh, and universities. Um, this would include uh, students pursuing practical nursing certificates, associate's degree in nursing, bachelor of science degree in nursing, uh, all included in that scholarship program. And this program also, it does, it does exist today. It is uh, administered um, 
with partnership with VSAC, uh, the program as it exists today has a service uh, component um, to the program. So for each year of scholarship, a year of service is required. Further, we propose to expand loan repayment for nurses who live in Vermont and who are permanently employed by, by Vermont health care provider employers. This program also um, contains a service agreement obligation to live and work in Vermont for each year of loan payment that would be provided through the program. This, this again, is an existing program. Um, the uh, Area Health Education Centers currently administer nurse uh, loan repayment for nurses. And again, we've also proposed um, a tax incentive for nurses and nurse educators. Uh, the tax credit would be available to those nurses and nurse educators living and working as permanent employees uh, for Vermont provider employers. And the incentive would include registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, licensed nurse assistants, and nurse educators. And uh, finally, we propose that the Agency of uh, Human Services, working together with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, leverage existing platforms um, for marketing the state of Vermont and establish a marketing campaign specifically to draw nurses from other states and internationally and to amplify the full range of incentives for living and working as a nurse in Vermont to include the scholarship programs, the loan repayment programs, tax incentives, the fast track for licensure, which uh, um, I know that we talked about in in the presentation of the Healthcare Workforce Development Strategic Plan. That is a program through the Office of Professional Le uh, Regulation. Uh, regulation speeds the path to licensure uh, for persons coming to work in Vermont. Um, the program of you know, marketing Vermont as a place to live and work would also um, feature the availability of relocation programs to support persons um, coming from away to live and work in Vermont and capitalize on the high COVID-19 vaccination rate in our state, uh, which does which does impact how providers um, are delivering health care. Now I can definitely pause here for for questions um, okay. for discussion. Super. So um, these are wonderful things, and uh, thank you for your hard work on this. Um, can you help walk me through the dollars? I see the the fifteen million and the eighteen million in the budget. Um, are there other dollars elsewhere? Uh, so. Yes, 15 and 18 million um, were proposed in the Budget Adjustment um, Act from two funding sources, both both for the purposes of the recruitment, retention, and training program. So that's a, a total of 33 million that was proposed. Um, the the proposal for the um, the uh, nurse scholarship program is um, for the FY23 budget to include 3 million for this purpose. For the no nurse loan repayment, the FY23 budget proposal is uh, for 2 million for this purpose. So it looks like a total of uh, 38 mil. For those initiatives, there's also a, a value for the tax, the income tax credit. I would certainly um, urge you if you're interested in exploring this further, this could be an area um, that you might want to speak with with tax department about specifically. Um, but I think that it, uh, you know this too um, has um, has is an investment as well. I'm pursuing this line just because um, 
I think most people uh, tuning in would think, geez, that's a lot of money. But then when you start to look at 120 million spent by this state and so on and so forth, and, and our neighbors to um, the West, New York State, the governor has a $10 billion healthcare uh, workforce proposal. So when you do the math, um, that works out to $494 uh, dollars for every resident of the state of New York. And if you did that same math for Vermont, you're talking about um, a little over 315 million that uh, just to, to stay competitive with our neighbor to uh, the West. So I just bring that up that um, when people hear these large numbers, um, it's really not large compared to what other states are doing. And I did want to uh, talk about um, the faculty because I was wondering if the administration is considering proposing language that would um, specifically raise the um, uh, the salaries for the nursing faculty in the state. I. We are not um, considering we're we're engaging in the work that the strategic plan outlined um, and in fact the office of professional regulation is facilitating a working group to explore the barriers particularly for increasing the number of students that are educated in vermont and those barriers um, as stated in the workforce development strategic plan do include exploring the differences between um, faculty pay and clinical um, pay, uh, as well as um, looking at the issues posed for the availability of preceptor slots. And that work is underway. Uh, that group met yesterday yesterday evening, um, or perhaps the day, no, yesterday, yeah. I earlier this week, that group met um, in the evening, uh, and and there was a very productive discussion there. So that work is going to be underway, and that will inform any potential further recommendations um, in this area. How quickly will those will those recommendations come out? Well, I think the group is 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 just beginning the process of exploring these issues, but understands that they're. Um, it certainly is uh, very much attention uh, on this issue and the will for there to be, you know, problem solving in this area. So I I think that it is it's feasible that there could be some recommendations or um, some insights from that work that come during the legislative session. I just hate to see this drag out. We've known about the uh, disparity in the uh, pay for. Um, educators for quite some time and um, I just want to uh, repeat a conversation that I had with an individual so this is secondhand information but um, I'm told that uh, Vermont Tech Williston um, only accepted about 20 percent of the qualified applicants this is qualified, qualified applicants applicant. for the, the for nursing that. program and you know we're in this crisis and to think that we have these Vermonters that want to um, dedicate themselves to a career in nursing and they can't get into um, a program, it, it just seems like the, the quicker we solve these barriers on both the uh, faculty end and on the precepting end, uh, you know, there's a time lag no matter what. Um, but it just seems like if this drags out for another year, we've just wasted another year to expand uh, our supply of nurses in, in the uh, coming years. So that's my concern there. Um, other board members? Questions or comments? Yes, Chair, this is Tom Walsh. I have some a question, Anna. Um, you mentioned a couple of the programs that have been existing and I, I and you may have gone through this before. I'm I'm new, but I was wondering about efforts to understand uh, their utilization patterns. Have they been highly utilized or not highly utilized? Why? And if they've been underutilized, what efforts are being made to address that so these new efforts 
are are uh, more fruitful. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, there's certainly more demand for these programs than there are um, than there have been a dollars available to meet the need. And so that was um, a factor in uh, the advisory group that advised on um, the healthcare workforce development strategic plan certainly encouraged that um, you know programs were uh, highly subscribed and that there could be an expansion and increased investment in these programs and both of the in both the case of the nurse scholarships as well as nurse loan repayment um, these programs have been popular and and utilized again with more applicants specifically in seeking nurse loan repayment um, than, you know, uh, significantly more applicants than need could be met. Thank you. Other comments or questions from the board? I was curious about the um, ta interagency task force and uh, sort of the status of that group. Yeah, we're working um, across agencies in strategic teams, very much task oriented and have been um, since, you know, uh, since the report was basically um, put into, uh, you know, put into effect, if you will. Um, and that work is increasing um, in frequency as we are tackling, for instance, key issues related to um, how we work together, uh, certainly to promote Vermont as the best, you know, as as it is. A really, the, I I was born and raised here, and I I'm here now. I love living and working here. It is a fabulous place, um, and so I, I think I can I can truly say it's the best place to live and work from my point of view. Thanks. Other questions or comments from board members? Well, I yeah, just two quick ones. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Um, I'll be I'll be real quick because I was going to ask the exact question that Robin asked. I'm sitting here looking at page six of the workforce report where it talks about the establishment of the state interagency task force. And I remember conversations about wondering, you know, because it was kind of an ad hoc group, um, you know, what what uh, how it would unfold, and I, I guess I just, uh, you know, uh, but Robin beat me to it. It's all yours, uh, Jess. Okay, just two quick questions for you, Ina, um, and thank you. It's, it's exciting to see some progress on this front, as we know it's an acute shortage. I'm wondering, one, um, when you mentioned the um, service agreement duration of 12 to 24 months, and I'm just wondering, like 12 seems awfully short, and I'm wondering if there is, um, you know, what is the evidence out there of the time it takes for folks to sort of integrate into the community such that retention rates are higher? Is there any evidence out there of what the duration, optimal duration is to basically retain those workers in our communities? And if you don't know that, that's fine. I'm just, that's something I, you know, when you suggested 12 months, it seems short to me. So I um, would love to think, you know, about that a little bit more. And then I guess the other question is, is there any uh, sense in which how much, how much this is going to impact the workforce? Sort of to Kevin's point about, you know, the dollars invested. And I'm wondering, for example, you know, is, you know, do we know if we had, increase you know scholarships by three million dollars how many nurses is that going to recruit into the state or you know for increasing the loan repayment by two million dollars just based on historical experience you know what is the marginal benefit on of that you know in terms of additional workforce and even just thinking about the 33 million do we have any estimates of the cost per recruited nurse that we could back of the envelope calculate how much is you know this investment? What can we anticipate being the increase in our workforce from these thirty-eight million dollars? Um, and I recognize back of the envelope is all that it could possibly be, but I'm just trying to understand how much of an impact it's going to have on our shortage. It's a great question. I don't want to try to do. I I I don't want to try to do some of that math in my head right now, but I can provide 
you know, I can definitely um, provide, and it's actually in the nurse, uh, excuse me, the healthcare workforce strategic plan, um, at least the scholarship and loan repayment information, that pl the plan captures how much we've had in investment available and the number of scholarships um, provided for, you know, within within the parameters of the dollars available. And so um, we certainly did look at if you provide significantly more dollars, uh, then you will, in, you know, be able to increase um, the the number of at least loan repayment opportunities or scholarships available. I can provide you that um, analysis, but I don't have it right at the top of my head. Thank you, you know, that's great. I, I would just follow up on that, though, that if, um, and I'm a big fan of scholarships for service. I, I think it's a great program, and I think that uh, you could get a lot more than the 12 months, but I, I just want to keep uh, striking this point that scholarships aren't going to help if they can't get into a nursing program, and so we need to expand the capacity. Um, otherwise, um, the scholarship dollars really haven't done anything other than display somebody that would have uh, uh, have found a way to pay for it anyways. And I'm not suggesting that scholarships aren't a good idea. I think they absolutely have to be part of the proposal, but I, I'm just saying that I think the highest priority has to be able to expand the capacity of the existing programs. I, 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 I appreciate that point. On, on the scholarships, um, on the on the scholarships, I do want to uh, clarify that the scholarship are that persons are eligible for the scholarship for more than one year of their study, and so for each year that they receive scholarship, then is the corresponding year of service. So if a person is a recipient of the scholarship for more than one year, then they do um, they do wind up with a service term that is longer than a year um, for each year of scholarship received. So it does stack up that way. So there's a little it's it's not just you get a scholarship and and it's twelve a twelve month agreement. I'm curious if the task force had any discussions about possibly um, if a, a student certified that um, they couldn't get into a program in the state of Vermont that uh, the scholarship could be used for a program outside of the state of Vermont. And um, as long as they agree to the service in the state and whether or not um, that idea would have any merit or is it uh, just another one of my boneheaded ideas because there's no way to enforce that they actually work in Vermont. So just curious if that conversation occurred. Well, the again, we're, we're looking to um, provide for increased investment in a current program. And my understanding of that current program is that it does prioritize um, scholarships first for those attending schools in the state of Vermont, but that it does not exclude scholarships for those who may be attending out, outside of school. But there, there is a hierarchy in the uh, prior, in, in the um, criteria. Do we know what percentage of the nursing students that graduate from UVM stay in the state? I don't know that person. No, I, I. It would be interesting to see, you know, like Castleton, there may be a lot of New York students going to Castleton because it's not that far from the New York border. I don't know. And it, I'm just curious, uh, you know, what the retention of the new students is within the state. And uh, I also think that on the other end, we need to uh, figure out ways to allow for more clinical experience and precepting. And, and uh, you know, that may mean some resource dollars to institutions so that uh, they can allocate the staff that they're so short on um, to um, actually precept with the students versus needing them just to uh, keep the uh, um, current functions going. So, I think I think your observation about retention of this 
of the students who are educated within the state is spot on and that uh, as we look at again the work underway to really amplify the all of the package of incentives for Vermonters to live and work in the or for nurses to live and work as uh, residents of the state and as permanent employees of healthcare providers, students are are very much a part of that a part of that audience. Just so much to do, Ina, and uh, I know you're so busy, and uh, I appreciate everything you're doing on this. I, I do wish we had uh, um, some more guns to help you, <laughs> but we don't. <laughs> I, it, I am not. I am not doing this work alone, I, and I think I shared this in our in our last discussion. We really are bringing together and leveraging the resources across agencies and departments. I'm, I may be the spokesperson for this particular plan informed by the advisory group, but this work is is being carried out in that in that um, uh, spirit of collaboration that's been very well practiced, um, particularly in light of the public health emergency. But that is, I think, it just um, uh, cooperation and collaboration across state government at its finest. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? Did you have anything further you wanted to uh, discuss with us or should we go right to public comment, Ina? I don't have anything further. I wanted to provide a general update to where we are. Um, we have made a significant amount of progress with the recommendations uh, in the plan and are continuing with the work to um, to carry out other recommendations that are, are part of the plan. And so I'm happy to share that progress with you today. I know that the board has likely been following some of that in, in the legislature and aware of what's been proposed in the budget adjustment as well as in the budget um, on, on the workforce front. And again, that the workforce um, workforce and investments uh, in workforce on the whole also um, contribute to improving the healthcare workforce, like I mentioned, um, and also was featured in the healthcare workforce development plan. Um, we certainly need to invest in those programs that would um, create more housing availability uh, and and support uh, child care availability in the state. Uh, both of those things ha are part of the administration's uh, budget proposal. We continually hear about uh, problems for housing for even travelers. So it's uh, something that uh, is a huge problem and some areas are better than others, but um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because you talk about the, the dollars that are in budget adjustment, it appeared like the hospitals were shut out from the House version. Did that get changed in the Senate, or are they still kind of left uh, in the dark for some of these dollars? I hesitate a little bit to speak to things that are, are moving, but um, my understanding of this Senate proposal uh, is that hospitals are included there. OK, so it'll be fought out in conference. <laughs> I, I, I will leave the legislative um, expertise to you, Chair. OK. <laughs> so at this point, we'll go to public comment and any members of the public who wish to comment, uh, please raise your hand. I see a couple of hands raised and I'm going to start with Dale Hackett. Dale. That really wasn't fair to Ina. That was putting her on the spot for sure, but it was a good question. Um, <laughs> I love putting Ina on the spot, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> She's an incredible <laughs> asset to the state of Vermont. Oh, absolutely. Um, no doubt about that. Um, you do really good work, Ina. Uh, you brought up an interesting point. I just wanted to comment that you can 
try to grow a workforce, but there is a great deal of synchronicity that goes with this. Um, you need to have the ability to, if a student wants to go into nursing, um, there's only a certain amount of time. They're young. They want to do it now. If, if you tell them that they, you won't have a position for them to go to school for another two, three, four years, um, that just doesn't work. It, there's no reason it should. So I would strongly support any school that can get into that that scholarship goes with them as long as they do come back to Vermont. My other comment of many I could make is when they get done, that service of whatever it is, if, if they're if they're in school for four years and they have to serve for four years, when you get done that four years, what we have to think about is, do we have the housing? Do we have the affordability? Do we have, are they all in sync? Are they all there? Because as you pointed out, the traveling nurse comes in, they can't get housing. Well, after they serve, why would they want to stay in Vermont? They never found housing. It, it just doesn't add up. So I just want to point that out, that there is that much bigger issue. And I don't know how we're going to do that because I don't know how the federal funds are going to go. I don't, there are so many unknowns, but it does seem clear what the challenge is. That includes the effects of the pandemic on the mental health of everyone. A student, a student that's in grade school, that's going to increase need for workforce within healthcare. Uh, I don't see anything moving forward without mental health becoming a really major issue in terms of sufficient capacity for those needs, or you're going to have people dysfunctional in a sense, and yet skill. Anyways, that's the end of my comment. Thank you, Dale. Some excellent points. Next, I'm going to go to Eric Schulteis. Eric? Hi. Um, I just, uh, so that was wonderful. You know, I wanted to, uh, board member Holmes's comment really interested me. And so the National Health Service Corps loan repayment program actually uses likelihood of staying as a criterion for judging how they're going to award those. So that perhaps uh, gets at her question. I also think I can only, I'm speaking from personal experience, these programs are exceedingly difficult to navigate for the person. I mean, the amount of time I've spent dealing with the public service loan forgiveness program is shocking. I mean, probably well in excess of 30 hours. And, you know, I read regulations for a living. Um, so, from a student's perspective, I think having assistance to navigate in the healthcare space seems particularly difficult because unlike in the legal space where there's only one program, there are four or five federal programs and then the state on top of that. And, you know, I don't know what medical schools do to educate students about it, but my law school had zero education on or someone to help you with it. I mean, it was all on me after I'd already graduated. So that's just something to think about that these programs are exceedingly difficult to navigate. Thank you, Eric. That's a great point. Next, we'll turn to Ham Davis. Ham. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I just have two kind of how many questions. I have two comments. One gets to your basic concern about uh, getting into nursing school and so forth. Uh, I think the, there's a, the reality is, it seems to me, is that the huge demand for nurses, overwhelming demand for nurses is true statewide. It's a national problem. And there was just a story in the New York Times a week ago that said that the rate limiting variable there is, is, uh, is, is really not money for salaries for 
for nurse educators is the flat out number of nurse educators and not enough nurses to teach all the people that you would nurses you would need to really answer the the, the difficulty in the supply line. The second is a comment about the overall, I don't have any problem with trying to get more nurses, trying to, you know, give them scholarship. I'd give them, I'd give, I'd let anybody in some countries, any, anybody that wants to be a nurse can go for nothing. And so, but the reality is, it seems to me, if we look at practically, then the situation in Vermont, I, that is, it seems to me, is that, that um, your chances of actually moving the needle in terms of the need for workforce is very small, really small, and it's going to take a really long time. And what I would suggest is that if you that what if what you're trying to, what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to find enough manpower, or person power, to operate a a 14 and a half hospital network for 600,000 people. If the reality the reality is you've got you've got way more hospitals you need, and you had a, had a whole string of consultants to come in here from Stroudwater, from um, you know from at Mathematica from at least five or six of them and they've all come in there and they've said your 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 uh that your your network the number of full service hospitals is way too high you can you can start to fix that today thank you thank you ham is there other public comment is there other public comment Walter, you're on mute, Walter. <laughs> the thing, the hand wouldn't click, so it cut up late. Uh, just thanks to Eric on his um, about the navigation of the of the problems of navigation with all the regulations. I hear that from nurses a lot, especially nurses who are training to be nurses. Um, I do know that systems like the NHS, National Health Service in Britain, which the right wing is now trying to destroy, but in any case, nurses go to college for pretty much free. They practice for a certain number of years and they pretty much stay there. And the same with physicians, they don't graduate with hundreds and thousands of dollars in debt like our physicians do here. So I'm wondering if that could factor in to what Vermont is trying to do, because Vermont is <clears throat> essentially locked in a comp in a state of competition with 49 other states about Pam's right. This is a nationwide problem as well. So I don't. It's just a generic question. Thank you, Walter. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? If not, we really want to thank you, Ina, and uh, we really want to thank you for all the hard work that uh, you've been doing, not only on the workforce, but uh, everything else related to healthcare as things are moving quickly in the legislature. And um, so thank you. And we're going to uh, now turn to um, uh, a discussion with DIVA and the proposed uh, 2023 updates for standard qualified health plans. And uh, I would ask um, Dana Houlihan if he could uh, introduce uh, the panelists. Dana. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, I think to start us off, I have Addy Stremlo with us and um, I'll turn it to Addy to to uh, get us started, and then I'll I'll turn to the presentation and our our uh, guest on the phone. Addy, if you're still there, I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, Addy Strumlo, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Vermont Health Access. I'm just going to provide a few um, general remarks and then turn it over to Dana and team to walk through the plan design presentation. Um, I wanted to mention you'll be seeing a lot of DIVA this winter between the QHP design work and the EHB benchmark update. As you know, uh, these are related issues, but we're talking about different plan years. So today we're here to talk about the standard qualified health plan designs for 2023. 
Uh, this year, most of the changes are driven by federal activity. Um, last year, when we were here on this topic, the new federal administration had not been in long enough to really impact the process except to kind of slow down the, the final payment notice and also to signal the new subsidy program. Um, I wanted to spend just a quick moment on enrollment and the subsidies. Um, we will have data for you next time, as is our tradition, um, but did want to just reiterate that the American Rescue Plan Act subsidies have been implemented. Um, they are currently in place through 2022, and they have driven uh, somewhat of an enrollment increase for us. Overall, qualified health plan enrollment is still down relative to prior to the pandemic, um, and that's because of the Medicaid continuous coverage requirement during the public health emergency. Um, so that dynamic is still in place. Uh, this year, CMS has been very active related to exchange policy. Um, they extended open enrollment through January 15th, uh, created new opportunities for special enrollment periods that we'll be taking advantage of, um, and they also made significant changes that impact plan design, uh, including updates to the AV calculator and other policy proposals related to the de minimis ranges. Um, so while we're happy to have the guidance, there there have been years when we haven't had anything when we're um, when we're coming to you all, um, but it has been a lot to react to, um, and really grateful for the work of the stakeholder group and our partners at Wakely to wade through all of that. So with that, I will turn it over to Dana to walk through our process and then to our partners at Wakely um, on the on the proposed designs. Great, thank you, Eddie. So if I can I will share my screen and get to the presentation. Can everyone see that? I can't yet. Can anybody see it? Now we can. Okay. Apologies for my lack of technical ability here. So as uh, as you know, we're here to talk about the 2023 standard qualified health plan designs. And I'm joined by Julie Pepper, Brittany Phillips, and Brooke Steiner from our partner organization, Wakely Consulting, that advises us on all the, the actuarial analysis and and modeling leading to this presentation today. I'm just gonna frame up a few uh, things about our process and um, then I'll turn it to Wickley um, Consulting to go through the uh, details of the federal ch um, guidance changes for 2023 and uh, the um, proposed plan design changes for 2023 as well. And then of course, we'll return next week for um, questions and further public comment, and um, at that time, hope for the we'll prepare for the uh, board vote. Again, just for grounding, I want to emphasize that we're we are uh, focusing on the uh, seven standard plans for today. There's one platinum, one gold, two silver, one of which is a high deductible health plan design and three bronze, one of which is a high deductible health plan, and that's each of these per issuer. So both Blue Cross and Blue Shield and MVP um, provide these same seven plans with the same benefits. Uh, I'll mention that there are also seven non-standard plans from each issuer that we will not be focusing on today. I just want to point out this um, this one page document that was also forwarded to you and is on the DIVA website. Um, this has all of the, uh, this is the 2022 page for 
Um, these are the standard plans where my cursor is these seven plans, one for each issuer. And over here are the non-standard or issuer choice plans for Blue Cross and MVP with rate information at the bottom. Again, a, a word about our stakeholder group composition uh, that I bring together every November to talk about the uh, next year's standard plan designs. We have representatives from all three of our issuers. We have a representative from the uh, Healthcare Advocates Office and staff, a staff person from DFR and the Green Mountain Care Board. So we meet from November through January each year. We just, in fact, finished our stakeholder design work last week. Um, so it's a, a very active discussion with regular meetings and a lot of you know, hard work and, and uh, thought goes into each of the decisions that we make. Some years are, I would say, easier than others. And this year, with the greater amount of federal guidance change, I think it was a, a little bit more challenging this year than, than some others. So I won't read these, but a little bit more on our um, stakeholder group values. Um, these five terms are very much front of mind for us as we go through our process. And in fact, in today's presentation, you'll see that we have included a proposal for uh, three primary care or behavioral health um, visits with zero cost share for the uh, for a silver plan or a bronze plan, um, which we think speaks to the uh, principle of both value and usefulness for the plan. That comes with trade-offs, as you'll see, for uh, other cost share changes that would be required to accommodate that, but um, more detail on that to come. In our process, as we go through each of the, um, the plans where we make our decision, we're very much uh, focused on um, sometimes a strategic min minimal increase is better than uh, not making any changes just to avoid a um, any kind of an abrupt change in the upcoming year. Um, you'll see that actually some of the 2022 plan designs are still compliant using the 2023 AV, AV calculator, but um, in most cases, we thought it was preferable to um, institute minor increases to, again, avoid something abrupt in the future. Focusing on cost always, both premium impact that's anticipated and also the, you know, the real dollar impact of the uh, cost share amounts that we're talking about. And then we wanna always be mindful of avoiding a plan design that could be confusing to customers or for uh, anyone else trying to explain the, the uh, benefits to a customer. A reminder that we will continue silver loading in in uh, 2023 to maintain the um, cost sharing reduction uh, benefits for qualified individuals. Um, so again, that means that on exchange, someone who's income eligible could get a re reduction in their cost sharing. Um, customers interested in silver plans who are ineligible for um, uh, income eligible for the CSR programs can get a lower cost silver plan directly through MVP or Blue Cross Blue Shield. And just to place a, a reminder again where this milestone that we're beginning today fits within the, um, the, the full certification cycle is uh, a, point, a few points here where it's this month where we're uh, getting our plan approval for the uh, standard QHPs. In March, the issuers file their forms, which is the uh, contract documents and, and uh, benefit summaries to DFR in March. The IRS guidance that affects plan designs is expected each spring. 
So it's possible we will need to return with some updates uh, to what we have today based on that guidance, but um, we have tried to anticipate what those increases or changes will be. <clears throat> so, the, but uh, we will certainly keep the board posted. Um, rate proposals are submitted in May, goes through its um, analysis and you know, public hearings and, and comments leading to the decisions in early August. Plan certification is actually completed by the FIVA commissioner. We target late August for that, which launches all of the uh, preparation work for uh, open enrollment to get the, uh, <clears throat> the DIVA system and for the issuers to prepare their systems for enrollment in the new year. And I, I just noted here the usual open enrollment period, this end date is, is subject to change depending on circumstances. So. so with that, I will turn it over to um, our partners at Wakely. And <clears throat> so they will start with a, a review of the 2023 federal guidance. Thanks, Dana. Uh, this I'll, is I'll great. stop sharing so that um, then you can pull that up. Great. Let me go ahead and share my screen. This is Brittany Phillips from Weekly Consulting. Thanks, Dana. Um, I'm joined by Julie Pepper and, and Brooke Steiner as well. So I think I'll I'll be doing the bulk of the talking, but you'll see their names on here as well. Um, the the plan for today is to talk through the proposed regulation changes um, for 2023, inclusive of the notice of benefit and payment parameters um, and federal AV calculator. Um, those are both in, in draft form, so subject to change, but we do have um, some changes to be aware of that have come out in the draft proposals there. Um, and then we're going to spend the bulk of the, the time walking through the recommended plan design changes um, that were discussed with the stakeholder group and, and we've been working on for the last couple months um, through that. So the first item um, to focus on, I want to uh, bring attention to a few changes that came in the draft notice of benefit and payment parameters. Um, so as I mentioned, this is still in draft form. These items could change in the final regulation, um, but as of today, the plan designs that we're presenting here are compliant with the draft regulations that were, were released. Um, so the first item that I want to mention is that they have proposed a change to the AV de minimis ranges for 2023. Um, so for the, the different metal levels, there has been a minus 4% or plus 2% de minimis range um, on the plan designs for the last several years. What that means for a silver plan, which is considered to be a 70% AV, um, a plan that actually falls within a 66 to 72% AV range is still considered a, a silver plan and compliant with this de minimis range. Um, so this tightens the range um, to negative two or plus 2%. Um, so for most plans, uh, again, um, a shrinking of the low end of that range that's acceptable. Um, the one exception is actually for silver on exchange plans where they've uh, recommended an even tighter de minimis range that actually goes from a 0% floor to plus 2%. Um, so again, for that silver plan example that I was using, this would be a 70 to 72% um, de minimis range. So we went from basically a, a 6% overall kind of range to now a 2% range on those silver on exchange plans. Um, similarly, the cost sharing reduction plans that are associated with the silver um, plan options, currently those have a negative one to plus 1% 1 de minimis range, so a much tighter range around those plans. Um, under the proposed change, that would also have a floor of 0%, so now we're looking at just a 1% de minimis range on those plan designs. Um, so some considerations around these smaller plan design or de minimis ranges. Um, 
I just want to note that the current Vermont standard plan designs are all um, towards the higher end of the de minimis ranges, so they're not specifically impacted by this change directly. Um, all of the plans continue to meet the, the minus two and plus two percent, even the silver plan is, is above 70 percent and so continues to meet that that tighter de minimis range, but it could limit um, options for changes in the future um, because we do have a smaller range around those those options. We are kind of limited in terms of the, the plan design changes um, potentially in future years. Um, the other item is that the reason for the uh, higher floor on the silver plans is likely to um, maximize premium subsidies available since those are um, tied to the silver plan premiums, um, having a higher AV range on those silver plans, um, generally speaking, should result in higher premiums, a higher benchmark, therefore used to determine the premium subsidies for members below certain income thresholds. Um, so uh, while it maximizes those premium subsidies for the subsidized individuals, it could limit options for individuals that are not eligible for subsidies. Um, since they may have fewer options at kind of a lower AV range available to them and, and potentially lower price points there. A few more items that came out of the uh, notice of benefit and payment parameters. Um, federal standard plans were reintroduced for 2023. Um, these had been introduced uh, several years ago, I think around 2017, 2018. Um, they were only around for a couple of years and then then removed again. Um, so those have been reintroduced. Uh, one difference is that this year, um, carriers in federally facilitated market in states with the federally facilitated marketplaces um, would actually be required to offer the standard plan designs, whereas previously it was um, noted as an option. Again, this does not directly impact Vermont um, being on a state based exchange and already having standard plan designs in place. Um, there's an exemption for uh, for Vermont in the, the proposed regs, but did want to mention it um, in case it comes up or, or you hear of those federal standard plan designs. Um, so we've provided a, a summary of the federal standard plans in the appendix of the presentation that Dana um, provided. Um, but a couple key points that I just wanted to mention in comparing those federal plans to Vermont's plan designs. Um, generally, they're at the very low end of the, the AV range. So um, basically at that floor of the de minimis range in across all of the metal levels. Um, so because of that, they tend to have uh, higher deductibles and out of pocket maximums relative to Vermont's plan designs and the plan designs that we've uh, we're proposing here. Um, also, generally speaking, the plans had combined medical and pharmacy deductibles, um, whereas most of the Vermont plan designs have separate medical and pharmacy deductibles. So for uh, members that uh, have uh, prescription drugs that are um, subject to the deductible it tends to be a much higher deductible that they have to hit in the federal standard plans relative to the Vermont plan designs. Um, they are similar to the Vermont standard plan designs in that they do have a mixture of copays and coinsurance. So generally the copays apply to office visit services, coinsurance to facility services, inpatient and outpatient services. Um, so in that that instance, they're um, somewhat similar. Again, generally the coinsurance levels are lower on the federal standard plans, but the copays for those office visits tend to be higher. So um, there's quite a few differences in, in the plan designs, but also some similarities we're seeing. Uh, the other item that we wait to, to come out in the notice of benefit and payment parameters every year is the annual limitation on cost sharing. So this is the maximum amount for a single individual that we can uh, set the out of pocket out of pocket maximum at. Um, so for 2023, this is, is actually no longer uh, submitted through the notice of benefit and payment parameters, but through a separate guidance letter. Um, so it has been set at 9100 for 2023, which is a $400 increase relative to the 2022 limit of 8700. Um, so one item to mention there is that is a larger increase than we've seen in the last several years. Um, and also because this is submitted through separate guidance, it is final um, and not subject to change with the final notice of benefit and payment parameters. So that's one item that we actually 
no is set for 2023 at this point. Um, as Dana mentioned, uh, we do not have the federal high deductible health plan, minimum deductible and out of pocket limits yet. Those are generally released late April or early May each year. Um, so those uh, numbers we are waiting on still. Um, the 2022 minimum single deductible is $1,400 and the out of pocket maximum is 7050. Um, generally that minimum deductible increases about $50 every two to three years. Um, the last increase was for the 2020 plan year, um, and the MOOP increase is about $100 every year. So the proposed plan designs um, for the high deductible standard plans, um, we have assumed that that minimum single deductible will increase to $1,450 um, based on the historical pattern um, and what we kind of know at this point. We think there's a really good chance that that will increase, and so we've reflected that in our standard plan designs. Um, there are other changes that, that I haven't listed. Um, as we mentioned, there's several changes that were released this year. These are the ones that are most closely rela related to the plan designs. Um, the other changes uh, have to do with, you know, may have premium impacts and, and other implications, but not necessarily on the, the plan designs themselves. Um, so just a quick refresher on the actuarial value calculator. Um, SOSIO releases a calculator each plan year. Um, right now that calculator is in draft form. So again, um, subject to change with the final calculator, although that's fairly rare with the, the federal AV calculator. Um, but this model has to be used to determine the actuarial value of a plan um, for purposes of determining compliance with those AV de minimis ranges and the uh, metal, val metal level of requirements. Um, so the calculator includes several inputs um, for various plan design features, deductible, out-of-pocket maximum, uh, copays for about, copays or coinsurance, I should say, for about 20 different service categories. So while it captures some of the most uh, highly utilized services, it does not um, capture every single possible service and every single possible benefit. Um, so because of that, there are some plan design features that are not supported by the AV calculator. Um, and in that case, uh, if the features are considered substantial, um, you can submit an actuarial certification to make adjustments to the AV calculator output um, for those features. So Wakely has been doing that for the Vermont standard plan designs for several years. There are a few features that are not uh, directly accommodated by the AV calculator. Um, the other item that I want to mention is uh, when we're talking about actuarial value, there's really kind of the, the federal AV calculator outputs that are used to determine meta level compliance. And then there's also a pricing AV that the carriers will use to actually determine the premiums for these plans. Um, so the federal calculator is based on summarized national data, um, whereas the carriers will use their own experience. Um, the carriers will generally use their own model. Um, and will not use the, the AV calculator to determine the pricing AV. Um, and as I mentioned, not all service categories are reflected in the AV calculator. Um, so there are uh, several reasons why the premiums that, that the carriers will submit may not directly align with the AV calculator um, output that we're showing uh, here. As far as changes to the AV calculator um, for this year, uh, the 2022, or sorry, that should say 2023. Um, the 2023 calculator is in draft format. As I mentioned, it's pretty rare for changes to happen between draft and final, but it is possible. Um, so the plan designs that we're showing are compliant with the draft version of that calculator. Um, the largest change uh, to the calculator this year compared to last year is that they noted that they actually updated the underlying data. Um, so last year, the calculator actually uh, did not change from 2021 to 2022 um, due to uncertainty around the impact of COVID um, and ongoing uncertainty around the pandemic. Um, so this year, they actually updated um, the underlying data from 2017 individual and small group data to use 2018, so more recent year of, of data. Um, and then they also trended the data from 2018 to 2023 to reflect uh, 2023 costs. Again, nationally re representative though, not specific to Vermont. Um, so the table on the right here shows the difference in the underlying data. Um, so we have 
allowed amounts per member per month in the 2023 calculator relative to 2022. Um, these represent both the combination of plan uh, payments as well as member cost sharing. Um, so it was meant to reflect kind of the total cost per, of service on average um, for the different meta levels. So you can see um, the silver uh, AV or allowed amounts increased substantially, um, a 14% increase over last year's calculator. Um, and the bronze allowed amounts actually decreased. And so the AVs that we're seeing um, when we run the 2022 standard plan designs through the new calculator are pretty consistent with these changes. We're seeing much larger changes on the silver plan um, plans relative to uh, prior years. And the bronze plan designs actually saw a decrease in AV under the new calculator. Uh, so as I mentioned, just a, a quick caveat, um, uh, the pricing AVs and the federal AV calculator output, the, those federal AVs um, are kind of different data points in terms of looking at how premium may be impacted um, by cost sharing changes. Um, so we've provided an estimated premium impact in the following slides. Uh, this impact is based on uh, Wakely's pricing model, um, running the standard plan designs through through our proprietary model um, and, and producing a pricing AV output. Um, this is meant to be reflective of the, the difference between the federal AV results and pricing AV results, and is really meant to show the trade-off between uh, member cost sharing at the time of service and premiums. Um, but as I mentioned, the carriers will be using their own models, their own underlying data um, to determine the actual premiums. And so those results that the carriers include in their uh, rate filings this spring may differ from what we're showing here. In addition, the uh, pricing and premium impacts that we're showing here are really only reflective of the benefit cost sharing differences. It does not include several other items that go into premiums, such as medical cost trend, um, network changes, you know, any of anything really outside of the benefit changes um, that that go into setting that final premium rate. OK, so starting to get into the meat of the, the standard plan designs. Um, what we are showing here uh, at the table is the 2022 federal AVC um, results and compared to the 2023 uh, calculator results for the 2022 standard plan designs. Um, so the rows that are highlighted are the ones that are outside of the de minimis range just simply based on using the different calculator. Um, so the gold and silver deductible plan designs both require changes in order to meet those new de minimis requirements, as well as the silver HDHP um, option. As Dina mentioned, even when changes are not required, um, generally the stakeholders have looked at uh, making minimal changes in order to help offset some of the premium impacts of, of the various cost sharing um, uh, changes and really kind of allow members to be used to, you know, some small incremental changes year over year versus large sweeping changes in a, in a given year. Um, so even though the uh, platinum and bronze plan designs do not require changes, we are uh, presenting some recommended options that are different from the 2022 plan designs for that reason. Um, and as I mentioned, we do uh, make a few adjustments to the AV calculator outputs um, that are not supported by the federal AV calculator. Um, and so those are, are reflected in, in the AVs that we're showing throughout this report as well. So just as a reminder, um, there are certain thresholds for changes to the standard plan designs that require uh, approval by the board. Um, so copays less than or equal to $15, coinsurance changes less than or equal to five percentage points, um, deductible changes less than or equal to 200, or out-of-pocket changes that are less than the increase in the federal out-of-pocket maximum. Um, so again, that's $400 for 2023. Um, so while we are showing all of the plan design changes that uh, the stakeholder group has decided on, not all of them explicitly require Green Mountain Care Board approval. Um, so in the following slides, you'll see we've shaded 
um, any of the changes that we're recommending um, in kind of an orange color and any that also require Green Mountain Care Board approval are shaded in green. Uh, so this slide is just a summary of the uh, proposed plan design changes that the stakeholder group um, came to consensus on. Um, we will go through each of the plans uh, specifically and through these changes in more detail, but did just want to know a summary of uh, the changes that are going to require Green Mountain Care Board approval. So uh, the silver deductible and HDHP options both require um, explicit approval, as well as the bronze deductible plan without uh, the pharmacy limit. So while we're uh, recommending changes to all of the plan designs um, or presenting changes to all of the plan designs, um, many of them are below that threshold that requires explicit approval. Okay. Uh, so starting to get into the, the actual plan designs themselves, um, for each of the plans, we'll follow kind of a similar pattern. So to get you accustomed to it a little bit on the platinum plan, um, this first slide that we're showing here is the historical uh, platinum plan options. Um, so you can see from 2014 to 2016, uh, this plan design was actually offered with no changes. Um, and since then, we've made some incremental changes year over year um, through last year. Um, so going from 2021 to 2022, the only change that we made to the plan designs was a $50 increase to the medical deductible. All other cost sharing features were uh, maintained for 2022. And in looking at the 2023 option, so we have the 2022 plan design um, in that uh, leftmost column. Um, and as as we mentioned, uh, this plan does not require changes in order to meet the de minimis AV ranges. Um, the 2022 plan design is at a 90.1% AV, um, so kind of right in the middle of that de minimis range. Um, however, due to uh, leveraging of fixed claim costs, so such as deductible, out-of-pocket maximums, co-pays, um, those fixed costs do have a, a premium impact if no changes are made. Um, it's likely that, that it will re result in a, a, an increase to premium. Um, so the recommended plan makes uh, some updates to the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. You can see shaded there. Uh, looking at a $25 increase to the deductible and a $100 increase to the out-of-pocket maximum. This results in a slightly lower uh, AV on the 2023 calculator relative to the 2022 plan design um, and an estimated premium impact of about 0.2%. Um, so some considerations for, for these options were, again, trying to make minimal changes kind of year over year, but, but also incremental changes so that larger changes are not required in future years, and also trying to uh, weigh that uh, trade-off between cost sharing increases or cost sharing changes when a member receives service um, and impacts to the premium. Um, the alternative plan design that we're showing here would actually be to maintain the same 2022 plan design. Um, as part of the stakeholder group, we you know, have looked at several different plan options um, and kind of narrowed it down to, to these two to share with you all, um, but really trying to, uh, again, uh, look at those those trade offs between cost sharing and premium. You can see maintaining that same 2022 plan design um, has an estimated premium at impact of about half a percent um, based on Wakeley's pricing model relative to the 0.2 percent if you make some of those incremental changes. So really showing that trade off. Um, in your slide deck, we also have some. Uh, kind of the, the follow-up notes. Um, I'm hoping to go through the considerations while we're looking at the plan designs, but for your reference after the presentation, if you need to go back and, and take a look at any of those considerations, we do have them written down in the presentation. So again, looking at the historical uh, gold deductible plan changes, um, similar to platinum, this plan design did not change from 2014 to 2016, um, but really starting in 2017, we've made incremental uh, updates to the plan designs for the gold plan year over year. Um, and again, kind of similar to the platinum plan, 
Um, last year, the medical and pharmacy deductibles were both increased on this plan. Um, so a $100 increase in the dedu medical deductible, $50 increase to the pharmacy deductible, as well as a $200 increase to the medical out-of-pocket maximum. In looking at the uh, gold deductible plan options, um, the federal AV for the gold plan is at 82.3% um, based on the 2022 plan design. So this plan does require changes in order to meet those de minimis ranges. Um, the high end of this range is 82%. Um, so we do have to make some changes to this plan design. Um, again, consistent with the platinum plan, the recommended plan increases the medical deductible. Um, it also increases the medical out of pocket maximum. Um, the increase on both of those is $200 um, relative to the 2022 plan design. Um, and again, you can see this brings the uh, federal AV down to 81.7%. Um, so about a 0.2% increase over last year's federal AV um, and a similar uh, estimated premium impact based on Wakely's pricing model for this plan design. Uh, the alternative plan um, looks at further increasing the pharmacy deductible, another uh, $50. Um, again, this has a lower premium impact, but um, is offset by that additional increase in the, the pharmacy deductible that members may, may face. Um, if you look at the, the prior uh, changes, uh, we have not necessarily changed the pharmacy deductible every single year. And so because it was just increased in the 2022 plan year, um, the stakeholders felt that keeping that um, at the same level as 2022 was a preference um, in the recommended plan design versus that alternative plan uh, discussion. Looking at the silver deductible plan now, um, this plan has had some larger changes year over year. Um, generally, as we get lower in, in the AV ranges, um, the, the incremental changes that have been required year over year simply based on the uh, changes in the AV calculator um, have get more and more substantial. Um, so uh, we have previously uh, made some increases to uh, co-pays and co-insurance on this plan. Um, in the most recent couple years, uh, the only changes have been to the deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums and really maintaining um, the consistency in those co-insurance and co-pay rates for, for members over the last couple years. In looking at the options for the silver deductible plan, um, the 2022 plan design is at a 72.9% AV. Um, this is a 1.8 percentage point increase over last year's calculator. Um, so as I mentioned, when we were looking at the changes to the federal calculator, the silver plan was uh, really uh, had the largest impact in terms of changes to the calculator and the increase to that AV. Um, so in order to bring this plan down below the 72% AV uh, mark, uh, it really required some very substantial changes uh, to the plan designs in order to meet those federal requirements. Um, I will say that the stakeholders spent the most time on this plan design. We looked at several, several options. Um, so while we've uh, kind of whittled it down to these two options, before you, there was a lot of discussion um, that led to these two options being kind of the, the final two in the running. Um, so this plan design has a $600 increase to the medical de deductible, a $100 increase to the pharmacy deductible, as well as an increase to the out-of-pocket maximum um, up to that limit for 2023 of $9,100. Um, and an increase to the ER copay to $500 in both plan design options. Um, we looked at, you know, the potential of doing a co-insurance rate on the ER copay as well, but ultimately decided that uh, the stakeholder group decided that the increase to the the ER copay was was uh, preferable to the co-insurance change. Um, generally, I think members 
uh, prefer copays and, and to know what their cost sharing is going to be. Um, but we did review that um, as it did have a pretty substantial impact on on AV, um, but ultimately decided against it um, for purposes of these options. Uh, the first option also has changes to copays. Um, so the first thing I'll note is that the PCP and mental health substance abuse uh, office visit copays. This plan design would offer three free visits um, prior to any cost sharing. Um, so that would be combined between PCP or mental health. Um, so, you know, two PCP visits, one mental health, all three PCP visits, it's a combination. Um, and that's consistent with uh, some of the non-standard plan design options that are available currently. Um, so again, speaking to kind of that member experience and, and ensuring there's um, not a lot of confusion with members, we did align those with the non-standard plan options that are out there. Um, in order to offer that free uh, cost sharing visits, we did increase the co-pays once that's achieved to $40 on the PCP and off, uh, mental health visits. Um, and then in order to maintain a similar relationship between the PCP co-pays and specialists and urgent care and, and uh, so on, uh, we have similar increases to the other levels. In addition, um, because that is a benefit to the member that increases the the AV, we also needed to increase the uh, generic pharmacy copay and preferred brand copays um, to accommodate those changes as well. Um, so there are several changes to the cost sharing under this plan design, but um, we did want to present it because it does represent a benefit to the member for those that have office visits. And so they, you know, could have um, some free coverage before paying any cost sharing for those office visits um, under this plan design, given so many changes that are required. Uh, this plan design does have a small estimated premium impact of about 0.3%. Um, the second option, again, has all of the same changes to the medical and pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximums, um, but does not have the free PCP office visits um, or the increases to the copays. Um, and the trade-off there is, is really uh, the, the estimated premium impact is um, pretty much offset by the changes to the uh, increases in deductible and out-of-pocket maximums. So taking a look at the silver high deductible plans, um, again, looking at the, the changes in prior years, um, generally speaking, the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximums have been increased. Um, as we mentioned, these plan designs have a some separate regulations, um, a lower uh, limitation, annual limitation on cost sharing relative to the other plan designs, um, as well as a, a minimum deductible that these plans must meet in order to be considered HDHPs. Um, so looking at the change from 2021 to 2022, uh, we increased the deductible $100. Um, in addition, there is a um, embedded uh, out-of-pocket maximum for uh, single members within a family um, that has been tracking with the uh, federal annual limitation on cost sharing. And so that was increased to reflect that, that federal regulation as well. Um, so looking at the 2022 plan design, this plan uh, came in at a 72.3% AV under the new calculator. Again, this plan design does require changes in order to meet those de minimis um, range requirements. Um, and again, similar to the silver deductible plan, had quite a significant increase in AV relative to last year due to the changes in, in the uh, underlying data of the AV calculator. Um, so we're looking at a 1.6 percentage point increase in AV of the 2022 sta uh, standard plan design, uh, simply based on the changes made to the calculator. Um, under the recommended plan option, um, Similar with prior years, we have increased the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. Um, 
the maximum for 2022 for HDHPs is 7050. So this brings it to the limit for 2022. Um, as I mentioned, we don't know exactly what the limit will be for 2023, though generally that increases about $100 um, every year um, as, a, as a check for you all. In addition, on these uh, on the HDHPs, the pharmacy deductible and out of pocket maximum are tied to the minimum deductible for HDHPs released by the IRS. Um, so again, we don't have that number um, finalized for 2023, but based on historical changes, we do anticipate that it will increase to 1450 for this year. So the options that we're reflecting here um, do already incorporate that change um, as needed. And again, the uh, embedded single out-of-pocket maximum has been increased to 9,100 consistent with the federal limitation and consistent with the changes we've uh, made to this plan design in prior years. Um, so the deductible increase is larger generally than what we've made in prior years um, for this plan. And that's really a function of needing to make that larger increase to offset the changes in the federal calculator um, in order to make sure that this plan meets those de minimis range requirements. Um, so looking at the estimated premium impact of that recommended plan, we're looking at about a 0.3% um, impact. And looking at the alternative plan, this one further um, increases the generic pharmacy and preferred brand co-pays um, relative to the 2022 plan design. Um, so it's a slightly smaller estimated premium impact. Um, however, for these plans, um, all services must be subject to the deductible except for preventive services in order to meet the, those HDHP re requirements. Um, so the increase in co-pays is really only um, goes into effect after the member has already reached um, their deductible, so it has a, a fairly small impact on the, the final AV and the estimated premium impact. Um, all right, moving on to the bronze plans. We're in the, the final metal level stretch. Um, the bronze deductible plan, um, Again, as I mentioned, this, this plan, uh, generally with the bronze plans, we've needed to make larger incremental increases year over year to accommodate the changes in the federal calculator. Um, so relative to say gold and platinum, you'll notice that these plan design changes um, have been uh, larger in magnitude relative to the other metal levels. Um, because the AV calculator did not change last year, we made um, only changes to the medical deductible, pharmacy deductible, and medical out-of-pocket maximum on this plan design. Um, and for this year, um, this plan with the update to the underlying data, the 2022 plan design actually had a reduction in AV um, based on the new calculator. Um, so this plan continues to be within the de minimis range and meet requirements. However, consistent with prior years, we are looking at some small incremental changes um, and, and some changes in order to help offset some of the premium impacts of maintaining the same plan design and, and balance the cost sharing and, and premium discussion. Um, so in the recommended plan, um, the only change would be to increase the medical out-of-pocket maximum from 8,700 to 9,100. Um, that's consistent with the change in the uh, federal limits for this year. Um, so going from the high end of the limit in 2022 to again, that, that high end of the limit in 2023. Um, and this has a estimated premium impact of about 0.8%. The alternative plan would additionally increase the medical deductible $150 to 6,600. Um, again, be, this has a similar premium impact to the recommended plan option. Um, as you increase those deductibles, there's fewer and fewer members that tend to hit um, the, dedu the deductible. And so it requires larger incremental changes to really move the needle on the premium impact there if you were to increase the deductible. Um, this is the bronze deductible plan um, that is not subject to the pharmacy limit um, in Vermont regulation. Uh, this plan was first introduced in 2018, so it's a little bit newer plan than the other uh, standard plans that we've been looking at. Um, 
generally speaking, the year over year changes have been to the uh, medical deductible and out of pocket maximum. Um, and pretty consistently tracking with the uh, federal limitations each year. Um, the one exception is 2021, where we did increase the generic pharmacy copay as well. So looking at the 2022 plan design, um, this has an AV of 64.2%. Again, similar to the other bronze plan, this had a, actually a small reduction in AV based on the change in the calculator, um, and it does continue to meet the AV requirements uh, for these plans without changes. Um, However, looking at the uh, recommended and alternative plans, similar to uh, prior discussions, you know, looking at those small incremental changes this year so that larger changes are not necessarily required next year. Um, so for this plan design, uh, the medical deductible and out of pocket maximum uh, is suggested to increase to $9,000. Um, however, similar to what we were seeing on the silver uh, deductible plan, we have uh, included the first three visits for PCP or mental health um, office visits at zero dollars and then would continue the, the copay of forty dollars that that they've had in prior years. Um, so with the increase to the deductible and out of pocket maximum, again, this does have a benefit to the member in the terms of the, the three free office visits. Um, because of the three office visits, this AV is a little bit higher than the 2022 plan design. Um, so those increase in deductible and out-of-pocket maximum doesn't fully offset that um, increase in AV uh, due to that benefit to the member and has an estimated premium impact of 0.9%. Uh, the alternative plan that we are showing here has a further increase in uh, medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum to 9100 um, has a much lower AV in terms of the federal calculator relative to the 2022 plan design or the other option that we're showing here, um, but has a, a similar premium impact. Um, so I want to pause here to show um, just kind of the impact of the difference in models and, and data that can influence the AV calculation of a plan. Um, so you can see the, the premium impact under the Wakely model is significantly different than the difference in the federal AV. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the carriers will use their own model. They'll come up with a, their own estimate for what that impact is. But um, again, just kind of highlighting the trade-offs between premium and uh, cost sharing. Uh, this is Dana. I'd just like to jump in with one point on the previous plan that uh, Brittany just reviewed, the bronze deductible with the RX limit. We um, Wickley found that if we had proposed the uh, three PCP or mental health behavioral health visits on this plan, it would have had such a large AV impact that um, it just didn't, it didn't fit so that we uh, decided against trying to squeeze it into this plan and and um, brought it into a proposal for the bronze deductible without the pharmacy limit. Yeah, thanks, Dana. I meant, I meant to mention that and walked right past it. Um, the difference with this bronze, bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit versus the other bronze plan um, is that currently the uh, PCP and mental health office visits are subject to the deductible. So offering the three free visits is significantly more impactful on this plan than on the other bronze plan where those uh, office visits are already pre-deductible, um, but with a copay. I think when when we looked at it to to put it into context, um, adding those three free visits on this plan would have required, I think, approximately a one thousand dollar increase to the medical deductible in order to meet the AV requirements on this plan. Uh, so now on to the the very last plan, the uh, bronze high deductible health plan. Um, very similar story here as far as the historical changes um, relative to the silver high deductible plan. Um, generally, we've increased the medical deductible and out of pocket maximum each year. Um, and again, increasing that embedded single um, out of pocket maximum to align with the federal limits um, year over year as well. 
Uh, for this plan, the 2022 plan design is at a 62.9% AV. This is, um, again, a reduction from the AV that we had last year based on the changes to the calculator. Um, however, again, we're you know, recommending some, some plan design changes in order to um, offset some of the premium impact um, and those, uh, those items um, limit future changes as well. Um, so in the recommended plan design, uh, we have an increase to the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum um, of $100 on the deductible, $50 on the out-of-pocket maximum, um, as well as increasing the pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, again, to align with the minimum deductible um, that we expect to hear from the IRS in the spring. Um, and then also increasing that uh, single embedded out-of-pocket maximum up to the federal limit of 9100 uh, the second alternative plan design is very similar to the first, um, except that we left the out-of-pocket maximum um, at the same limit as 2022. Um, again, uh, fairly similar uh, in terms of AV between these two plans. The $50 limit didn't have a, a large impact, um, but further trying to uh, limit the estimated premium impact on a, a plan design that uh, tends to have larger premium impacts. Um, but again, this plan is uh, is limited um, in terms of the out-of-pocket maximum at a lower level than uh, the federal limit at 9,100. So uh, that is 7050 for 2022 generally increases $100 each year. So we really don't have, um, don't anticipate having a lot of room to increase the out-of-pocket maximum on this plan, but have looked at increasing it um, a little bit for 2023. Um, so again, this slide is a rehash of the prior uh, slide that kind of kicked off the, the standard plan design portion of, of the presentation. Um, just meant to be a summary of all of the changes that uh, we've walked through, which plans require um, G uh, Green Mountain Care Board approval explicitly, but also a summary of the, the plan design changes that, that we're looking at for all plans. Um, so as a reminder, a reminder, we're uh, seeking approval for the silver deductible um, plan design, the bronze plan design without the pharmacy limit, and the silver HTHP. Um, all other plan designs are below those thresholds. Um, though again, we are providing that that summary here, um, along with with the plans that do require approval. Um, so that concludes the my part of the presentation. Um, there's some additional information in the appendices of the presentation that Dana provided on the uh, cost sharing reduction plan designs associated with the silver plan options that that we walked through. Um, those plan designs do not require approval and are tied to the standard silver plan. Um, so kind of limited in terms of the decision points on those plans, but we've uh, provided them in the, the appendices for you to review. Um, in addition, the appendices have those federal standard plan designs as well, if you're interested in taking a look at those. Thank you, Brittany. Dana, is it OK for uh, questions and comments? Yes. OK, I'll open it up to the board for questions or comments. Hi, this is Robin. Um, thank you for your very thorough presentation, Brittany. Um, I would actually be interested in getting more background on the discussion related to the three visits um, with no cost sharing in terms of both why three, why uh, the plans that you chose and not uh, more consistently throughout the plan designs. You, uh, Dana mentioned it in terms of the, the impact for the bronze deductible with Rx and of course the high deductible health plans have federal limitations, but why not try to do something a little more consistent to make the messaging to the consumer a lot easier. Uh, yeah, I can start. I can start with that, Brittany, if um, if I may. We definitely discussed the the idea of introducing the um, behavioral health PCP visits at all metal levels, and um, after a lot of discussion, thought that the 
um, because the bronze, excuse me, the platinum and gold plans are richer with a low, a you know, significantly lower um, copayment and um, deductible amounts to reach that, that we thought the greater value would be in the silver and bronze plan. So we, we excluded that from um, platinum and gold after considerable discussion. And we, to your other question, we did start with discussion of two visits without, without uh, cost share. Um, after a lot of discussion uh, for a couple of reasons, landed on three for, it was first, you know, greater value to the, um, uh, you know, to the enrollee, we looked at the utilization of the free PCP behavioral health visits in non-standard plans and thought um, three might, three was a better tipping point than two. And also because of operational concerns where the non-standard plans are, that offer that benefit are, um, the, the issuers have focused around three, so there would be a greater operational lift if um, it had to be implemented with a number other than three. So, Brittany, anything you would add there from the discussion? Yeah, the only thing I would add is when we were looking at um, whether to offer two or three uh, free PCP and mental health office visits, um, the incremental AV impact of moving from two to three was was relatively small. Um, so in order, you know, being able to offer a higher benefit, more benefit to the member um, for not a very significant um, Cost in terms of of AV, AV impact and, and potential premium impact, um, also I think influenced the decision a bit. Is it possible to get the utilization information that you looked at in the non-standard plans? I will take a look at that and, and um, yes, see what we can what we're able to share. Great, um, and then also. Um, I certainly understand like with a uh, gold and platinum with platinum, the, the visits are, I think $15 and $20 at gold. Um, but I'm curious to know if we wanted to have that same benefit at those levels, if there are other AV cha other changes that would need to be made, um, to, to stay within the AV levels. Sorry, I'm just I'm gonna scroll up so I can remember sure. exactly where <laughs> where those okay. AVs are. <laughs> yeah, and you can certainly get back to me. You don't have to answer it today. Yeah, if, yeah, I think we would would need to. Yeah, I think we would need to take a look at it. Um, generally speaking, I think we have a little bit more room in terms of the high end of the AV range on platinum and gold. So um, there there's potential that it could be added, but we would have to take a look at it. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? I got a few. Um, every year, this feels like a brand new, brand new corn maze, you know, that uh, you've been out in the field planting corn and created a maze that is different from the one the year before. It's so many moving parts. Um, so thank you for... <laughs> Thank you for uh, engaging in all this complexity. Um, so I, as I went through this year's uh, presentation, there were, um, you know, a few areas, and I think you mentioned them during your presentation here, where stuff um, is not in final form yet. You know, I a quick list is the notice for benefit and payment parameters still in draft form. The federal HTHP minimum deductible MOP limits are not yet released for 2023. The federal AV uh, calculator um, is, is based on summarized national data, but in the end, it's the carrier's uh, utilization and experience data that kind of drives the bus. And I'm just wondering, um, given these, we're here, we're being asked to approve um, cost sharing increases that get baked in going forward to our rate review process when these plans come before us in rate review. Um, 
you know, how much volatility does the fact that we don't, are there any of these pieces of information that we don't have that are final, not final, um, more critical than others? Or is this just noise at the edge of the process? Yeah, so one quick clarification, the uh, federal AV calculator, it is in draft form, it's not finalized, but that is the calculator that we have to use to determine compliance with the, the metal level AV de minimis ranges. Um, so the carriers will use uh, their own price, their own models to determine the premium impact, um, but in order to determine compliance of the cost sharing and the plan designs themselves, um, we do have the draft version of that, that calculator. Um, as far as the items that are not finalized and let could... Me just follow up on, let me just follow oh, yeah. up on that point. So we're going to be making decisions based on this draft calculator, but the final could be somewhat different, but it's still this calculator that, that counts in terms of the process. So the, yeah, the final calculator, uh, I, I think it's very rare that there have been changes between the draft version of the calculator that these AV amounts are based on um, and the final version. I can't necessarily name a time off the top of my head where that has specifically changed. Um, so the, I think there's not a lot of um, worry that that may change, although it's certainly possible. And so that's what we want to make aware. Yep. Um, as far as the other items that are draft that could potentially change things. Um, as a, a an example, last year, the draft notice of benefit and payment parameters suggested a federal limitation on cost sharing of 9100 um, up from 8550. And between the draft version and the final version, the administration changed and they uh, reduced that amount to 8700. Um, so we did have to come back to the board and present new plan designs that were compliant with that that change. So there is the potential that um, some of these will impact the plan designs. Um, but I think generally speaking, the plan design changes that we've had to make in the past, and, and Dana can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think generally speaking, the plan designs we've made after this point have been relatively small. That's true. I, I would also want to just underscore the point that, uh, you know, with our expert advice from Wakely, they, they're very good at anticipating what the uh, changes would be. And some of the anticipated changes are already built into our proposed plan design. So um, that mitigates the, the need to return with corrected figures. But um, if there was, as Brittany said, if there were any changes required based on unexpected changes between now and the, the release of the final uh, figures, we will um, bring that back to the board. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I'm looking at some of these uh, recommended changes as percents as opposed to dollar amounts. And uh, so looking at the silver plan, uh, the increase in the medically de deductible from 3,400 to 4,000, that's a 17.6% increase. The increase in combined um, out-of-pocket maximum from 8,550 to 9,100 is a 6.4% increase. The um, the amount associated with, with associated with the emergency room co-payment is a 100% increase, going from 250 to 500 dollars. And so I kind of look at that, um, and uh, there are some other increases. You know that have just been um, in, that are quite large that are just part of Diva's presentation and that aren't coming to us. And then you get down to the estimated premium impact range, and you know it's like two tenths of a percent um, for the platinum, three tenths of a percent for the silver, um, and then in the bronze you you get to eight tenths of a percent, nine tenths of a percent, and one point two percent. And I'm just wondering have you folks ever gone back and looked at um looked in the rearview mirror and said well this is what we told the board and now we've gone through rate review etc cetera, etc cetera, and 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 it's finalized um and we were right on the money or we were off because it you know for me it's just hard to look at these kind of percentage increases and knowing you know on top of thousands of dollars that are base that are already there and kind of say yes to them. I mean, maybe I have to say yes, but to say yes to them, but then think about this entire process going forward 
and in rate review. And these, these, these increases are already baked in when the carriers come to rate review and they're never discussed again. And I'm just wondering, you know, just trying to get a sense of certitude that in saying yes to these, that they're somehow statistically related to the estimated premium impact range, that that relationship um, is a tight one and one that we can, you know, rely on as assuming so much changes, including the fact that the carriers in the end are the ones that 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 are the the basis for the the, the premium increases that they present on the board. So I'm just wondering, have you folks ever gone back and looked at your work against the reality as it actually unfolded and feel comfortable that um, uh, what's being presented to us is is putting us on pretty solid ground? Yeah, so unfortunately, it's really difficult to tease out these benefit, the specific benefit changes when it comes to the rate filings. Um, as I mentioned, what we're showing here is based on Wakeley's model. The carriers will use their own model. What we're really trying to provide is, is another data point for your consideration, um, but the carriers are ultimately going, going to use their own models to price, and it could uh, differ from what we're showing here. Um, in addition, because we're really just focused on those benefit design changes, when we look at the actual premium filings, there's a lot of other items that are uh, baked into that. So medical cost trend, any sort of changes in provider contracting, um, induced utilization assumptions made by the carriers. Um, so there are a lot of other components that really feed into the, the premium change and, and those rate filing pieces that make it really difficult for us to tease out this specific um, piece of it in order to do an apples to apples comparison to to what we're showing here. I would like to add to the, uh, the on behalf of the whole stakeholder group, you know, there's a lot of discomfort around some of the magnitude of the cost share changes that are required to move that needle on the actuarial value so that if it was anything less than that, we wouldn't have the impact that we would need to keep a a particular plan compliant um, with with the uh, AV in the new in the new or upcoming benefit year. So, and then as Brittany said, the the data point or the reference to anticipated premium impact is directional. It's not you know it's it's helping provide an additional consideration for. Uh, you know, among other things, we're doing, you know, taking, making one choice with a benefit cost share change versus another, and, um, you know, keeping that in mind, what is likely to happen with premium, understanding that it's still calculated by the, by the issuers based on their utilization and uh, data rather than this. So, we can certainly I wonder if there's any. I, uh, I guess it's just our own discipline then that we have to keep in mind that when we get to rate review, we've already approved these increases. And some of them, you know, are de minimis in the big structure of stuff. But when you are the, the, um, the, the I don't want to say patient, but that's not what I'm looking for. When you're the individual out there that's that the member in the plan and, and that's your deductibles that are going up by 16%, you feel it. And uh, I'm sure that's they feel good. it. And I just got to keep that in mind that we're not starting with a blank slate when we're going through rate review. We've already increased for those folks um, their uh, uh, co-insurance, their co-payments. Um, another, I only have a couple of more questions. Um, one is on, it was on the uh, three PCP visits. Um, and at the beginning, you had a slide as to what was in our domain. And I think the language is that um, uh, the guardrail was $15 on co-payments, uh, but this is a $35 decrease. So it's outside that $15 uh, range. Um, it goes from 35 down to nothing. And so that's a $35 change. And I, so I'm wondering if, if we should have a vote on that or, um, or is maybe it's just the way it's written. I don't understand it clearly, but um, I, I thought that the, or as I read it, that the guardrail was $15 and change, whether it's up or down. 
um, and this one happens to be down, um, and it's $35. I, I would respond to that, but there's, if this is a, uh, just an alteration to the structure for those three visits, but then when the co-payment returns after those three visits are up, um, there, there's still a co-payment that's um, very similar to the previous year. We, you know, in the silver plan, there would be, I think it's a $5 increase in the cost share after three visits. Uh, in the bronze, it would stay the same. Um, so we're not eliminating cost share for all PCP mental health visits, but for the first three as an added value. No. I'll, I'll also add that those plans have other changes that require approval as well. Um, so those those plans need specific approval for for other changes. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, and I think maybe my final question is the fact that this is will be the second year of these new federal subsidies, expanded federal subsidies. I think 22 was the first year. Um, how does how does that factor into your 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 deliberations or your that the thinking of the working group about um, you know I mean because sometimes I worry that these these subsidies that really make healthcare affordable to some people but that's also an area into which you know people who want to expand benefits et cetera might want to grow and so over time then the, that affordability that's been achieved gets diminished. And I'm just wondering if in your deliberations, um, uh, do are people pretty aware that those subsidies are out there making making these plans more affordable and therefore they can afford to you know, do more? Um, well, let's just be clear, Tom. Those subsidies, uh, the expansion of those subsidies are not um, available for next year yet. Um, well, I understand that. I, I, I guess I'm making the... Uh, State House assumption in Congress that once you put something in place, you can't take it away. But you're absolutely well, right. Was it built back better, and that bill is dead? So the question is, do they get together and put it someplace else? And that's a whole nother question for Dana as well, because uh, there's language in in our state legislature that would uh, allow the date uh, to be um, held out there as September 1st. And in the past, Diva's always wanted. Um, information to input for the exchange product before that. So um, just to piggyback onto your uh, question and just to make it clear that nothing is set in stone at this point as far as a merged or unmerged market or anything. Yes, and, and our role too is to propose plans that are compliant with their actuarial value. So um, whether the subsidies continue or not, uh, we're required to do that. And by continuing with the, the quote unquote silver loading program that um, continues the cost sharing reduction program um, in Vermont, which is you know, we're entitled to do. Um, so I think we just had to go forward with you know, the AV review work that we've always done with this and, and hope that the subsidies remain, but it's, uh, it's the same requirement whether or not they continue. So that I mean so I, I think the combination of the answers is that yes, those subsidies are in the background and assumed, but the chair is absolutely right. Nothing nothing is uh, is uh, baked in stone or baked in whatever it is, baked in uh, yeah. baked, baked baked in certainty. Right. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your work on this. This is incredibly complex and don't 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 ever give me a test on it because <laughs> there's too many moving parts. Um, but thank you, Dana. Can you live with that proposed September first date on merging or unmerging markets? Yes, we think that's kind of the outer limit, you know, in terms of operational, you know, readiness after that. But we, yeah, we think the nine one date would be okay. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? This is Tom, uh, Tom Walsh, following Tom Pelham. Um, thanks for th thanks for all your work. And um, a lot of this is is new to me, so I have a a couple questions that um, just help me get my head around this a bit. With the slides that you had, could you bring those back up and go to slide fourteen for me, please?
There you go. Thank you. So yeah. I was I was trying to understand um, this, and it it I think some of my questions are along the line of Tom P's. It seems like there are a lot of a lot of inputs into the model that right now um, have uncertainty around them, and that uncertainty ar around the components. I don't have a good idea how much uncertainty is there. Is that a is that a one percent, two percent, or five percent swing either way, with each of those variables? Can you help me understand that a little bit more? Yeah. So the purpose of um, the pricing model and what we're showing is the the estimated premium impact. Again, we're really focusing solely on these benefit changes. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have is a, a model and, and the AV calculator works similarly, but different methodology, um, but we've got. It seems like the AV calculator though, pardon me, the AV calculator, it's an estimate right now, but you're fairly sure that it's gonna be similar. It's, it's a draft version. Um, so they submit the federal AV calculator for public comment. Um, right. So there is potential that they could make changes to it, but again, pretty unlikely. That, um, seems, that seems pretty solid then. Yeah. But the, the other model that you're talking about, that seems to have a lot of components to it that seem each of those components can vary somewhat. And I'm just trying to get a sense of how much variability. Yeah, so the the other model that we're using is it's Wakely's pricing model, but it's it's really meant to do uh, benefit modeling. So we take um, our underlying pr proprietary data. It's based on individual um, and small group data nationally. So kind of a similar population to the AV calculator um, and applies uh, continuance tables and these cost sharing to determine the portion of benefits paid by the member versus the the carrier, um, and that's the AV that that we're uh, that we're showing. It's the actuarial value. Um, so the components that we're not accounting for in that, I think, are the ones that have more uncertainty, um, and that's really around you know what providers are contracting or what carriers are provided or contracting with their providers, um, what their underlying data data looks like. They'll use a different set of underlying data versus what we have. So we're using the tools that are disposal. I don't think that I wouldn't say that there's um, necessarily uncertainty around it, but I think there are different method methodological approaches and different data that the carriers will use to do their actual determinations of the the AV. Right. And and so I'm I'm trying to get a sense of you've you've been clear on this slide and in, in other parts of the conversation about some uncertainty. And then we, you presented the tables to us. And how sure can I be that those figures are going to stay pretty much where they are? Or could they change a lot between now and rate review? Yeah, so I, I think this is uh, similar to Tom's question before. Um, we are fairly, you know, the, the federal AVs that use to determine the metal levels and the de minimis ranges are, are fairly set because we're required to use the federal AV calculator um, while in draft form, unlikely to change. So those federal AVs are, are set. Um, the weekly, the, the estimated premium impacts, I would say, are, are not. We, we know that the carriers will, will differ in terms of their impacts um, from what we're showing here. So what yes. we're showing here is, is really meant to, again, provide a, a data point of the trade-offs and potential uh, conversation around, you know, a hundred dollar right. increase to the deductible versus this. Here's kind yeah. of direction, directionality yeah. more than anything. Yeah, Dana had mentioned that earlier. There are more directional estimates than a spot on estimate. Right. I think that's can just. I, can I just jump in on this point when you're finished with your thought, Tom? Yeah, um, you can jump in anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I, I interrupt it all the time at home. This is. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry about that. I would yep. just want to make a note that um, when we do rate review, we do see impacts from benefit design changes. 
my in my recollection, the only uh, benefit design changes that I would call significant in the past few years has been around a major change uh, that was legislatively driven related to chiropractor and physical therapy visit copays. So we do see the actual impacts from the carriers based on the state data. So the difference is Wakely's data and the carrier's data are not the same. So the numbers will not be the same. But personally, I don't think we've seen that be a huge issue in rate review, monetarily speaking. Thank you. That's that's where I was trying to get to, right? And if we could, um, from past years, right? We're, we're saying there's uncertainty now. We, we expect certain things and we can't really predict. But as Tom was saying previously, we could look back and see how the expectations matched with observed. And what you're telling me is that there's not big changes. Not so that I can recall other than the chiropractic and PT. And I think we could do that, but I think quite frankly, that would be on us or our staff and actuarial support, not on Wakely because they don't have access. They're not our actuary for rate review. So they don't have that information. So I think if we wanted to do that, that would be something that we would ask our actuaries and rate review to do if okay. we felt like it was worth the cost. I, I appreciate one other thing I'll it. add to the conversation is just to kind of um, emphasize, you know, even among the issuers, they're going to have different estimates. I just went back quickly to make sure it was still the case because I remember it being the case a couple of years ago where for the silver standard plan designs, um, one of the issuers has the deductible plan as being more expensive than the HDHP and the other one has the HDHP being more expensive than the deductible plan. So they even in their pricing models have valued the impact of the, the the relative impact of those different plan designs. So again, it really is kind of what their experience is. It could be their underlying populations. Um, hopefully, this is just kind of an incremental change to kind of how they've already set the premiums. But based on their data, they still may come up with different estimates. So yeah, to Robin's point, we're we're definitely happy to if if you do go through the process of collecting the information, we can consider that in the future as we're putting together pricing um, estimates. Um, yeah. It, it um, it was just helpful to me um, to think about past performance and how what how well things line up, right? Um, and I think th the other thing, and this again follows very closely with with Tom. I think the percent change would be a good column to to have because in the lower um, the silver and and bronze plans. Um, those are substantial percentage changes into any of us managing our own budget. A 15% a change is meaningful to us. And, and I think that that would be um, helpful framing for when we're considering these changes. So if possible, I think that that would be a nice addition. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tom. Is there other public comment, uh, other board comment or questions? If not, I'll open it up to public comment and I'll recognize Dale Hackett first. Dale. So bear with me. I'm going to describe a quick scenario the best I can. Um, take it for what it's worth, but I think it's a scenario that will play out. I'm looking at this, I'm looking at what I can afford to buy. I, I've got two kids, a little one, one that's about six years old, and I'm trying to find a plan I can afford to buy. And I, I, I can I can just see myself getting by on that premium right there. But I'm looking at the out of pocket max. There's no way I can afford that. I can afford a couple of doctor's visits, but boy, if I have anything major come up, it's just a debt. That's all it is. There's no way I can afford it. Um, the only thing I want to do, I don't want to buy health insurance. I think I can take the premium because I, I got a son that's got epilepsy. I could be able to afford his medications. I think I can do more by not buying the health insurance, make sure that I can buy the medication 
and put food on the table, a diet that serves epileptics and supposed to help prevent seizures and do these, like my daycare, I can more easily afford. And that means I can work because I'm better off in terms of, I know I've got daycare. Yeah, this is a pretty good deal. Um, I can actually get more value by not buying health care except for the tragedy that might hit, then if I actually buy it, because once I buy it, I've lost the money within the household and I still can't afford anything. End of comment. But Dale, just to uh, follow up on your comment, it, it, you can't make a blatant statement like that because depending on what those incentives are at the end of the day, um, you might be much better off buying the product because you may get enough help um, so that it wouldn't uh, um, be less expensive just to uh, um, not insure. So it's it's a tough one. It, it depends on exactly what your income is. That's why everybody really has to uh, use the calculator and, and uh, make their decisions. But I, I don't, personally, I don't think I could ever recommend to somebody that it's their best option to um, not buy the insurance. I think there is a window in there where it is true. It doesn't, I know what you're saying, Kevin, and I agree with you. I'm not, but when I'm on the other end as the dad or the mom, I think that's going to be true. There are some that are going to end up in that situation and it will be the reality. It shouldn't be. We, we shouldn't allow it, but it could be the truth. Well, let's hope that there's some uh, reason that occurs down in Washington and that the enhanced incentives are uh, approved again for next year. I agree. Um, but that's why I said the way I did. I just wanted to Yep. flag that as like, boy, this is really alarming to me. Um, and that was my way of saying it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dale. Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just a couple short more comments. Thanks to Tom for what he had said earlier about do these people ever consider <clears throat> the repercussions of their rate increases? Because I think that those who make these rate increases and do all these plans should actually have to live them and pay for them themselves to understand what it means for us to have to pay for them. All the deductibles, all the co-pays, and the sheer vast complexity of trying to figure out these plans. The next comment is that why in America do we have to make something simple so complex? I mean, I think a NASA moon launch is less complex than what we've heard today. That's thank, it. thank you, Walter. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I wish to uh, thank you, Dana and Brittany and Addie and uh, Julie and everyone. Um, it's a complex subject and uh, it's one that uh, I'll have to uh, do some more homework on and uh, we'll continue this conversation. But thank you for the presentation today. It was very helpful. Thank you. Very thank much. you for your time and attention. We'll be back next week. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. It's like, that, Arnold, there, you, it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? There is. Second. Second. It's It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay.
Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.